All right. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. Welcome back to the podcast, Andrea. I'm really excited to have you. We did a shorty with you and everybody is desperate for more. So here we go. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners who are new to your story? Yes. Well, first, thank you, Rebecca, for having me back on your podcast. I'm so happy to be here again. Um, My name is Andrea Krill, and I'm the founder and lead designer at Andrea Krill Interiors. Um, I run an interior design firm that's based out of Philadelphia's mainline area. We offer full service design for both decorating and renovation projects. And I really tell people that we excel at creating colorful, beautiful, livable spaces for busy professional families. I am also a wife and a mom to four beautiful, but very loud and very crazy kids. So we also have a busy household here. Um, A bit of background about me. I spent nearly two decades in the accounting and finance industry um, before pivoting to design. Um, And I know that I'm not the first accountant um, to turn into an interior designer, but I do often get asked um, how I transitioned from being a CPA to running a design firm. And I have to say, I was really greatly influenced by my upbringing. I grew up in a family. Uh, My dad was a contractor, a master carpenter, and he built the house that we grew up in, literally nail by nail, board by board, um, on in his spare time on nights and weekends with the help of all of his friends and family members that also were in the trades. Um, During that time, we lived with my grandparents who were antique dealers. And so I spent a lot of time with them on weekends going to different antique markets and fairs. Um, And mostly I would just say that my parents instilled in me a love of home and, um, you know, taking pride in where you live and investing in your home. And so for me, as I became a homeowner and started raising my family, um, I really kept those same values um, and loved turning, you know, my own home, decorating it and renovating and that sort of thing. Um, I'll have to say friends and neighbors, um, family members, they started to take notice. So they would ask me, um, you know, for my design advice or help, and I was always happy to do it. Um, With that said, you know, I was not always a designer. I pursued a really traditional career path as an accountant. Um, And I think somewhere along the way, I just realized that there was more for me out there, um, something bigger and better, and that happens to be design. So, oh my goodness, I I love your story. I love that you come from... (laughs) like CPA, like what? Like everyone's looking to hire CPAs because they don't even want to touch the numbers. People don't even want to do their own spreadsheet. So uh, I think that's going to be a huge asset to you. I'm sure you're already seeing that inside your design firm. A lot of designers do not enjoy that side of it or or even have really the skill set to do that. Um, and I love that you moved, and we talked about this in the shorty episode, like this idea of why you wanted to move to starting your own design firm. And guys, you can go back and listen to the shorty episode. We'll link that in our show notes. Um, But what I'm really interested in is a little bit more of that story of like working full time for what was likely a very demanding career, I imagine, um, and raising a family of four Mm -hmm. to then deciding you wanted to do a design business as a side hustle. And you, from, from my memory, You took Power of Process for the first time in 2023, and it was, you were still a side hustle. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. That was still a side hustle. Yes. And then after taking the course, moving into that year, you really started to implement all the things you learned in your business, but you were still, it was still a side hustle, right? For a little while. That's correct. Um, Yep. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, sense power of process, what I've seen, like you've just kind of blossomed, exploded, and it's amazing. I can't wait to talk about all the details. In the spring, I don't know if I asked you or if you offered, but you emailed me the most beautiful email and it was a testimonial. And I was thinking, I'm going to get a few sentences (laughs) of somebody saying, the course was great. 
great. I loved it. And it was like, honestly, I think I maybe even cried. I'm not going to oh. lie. I printed it. I'm like, this is like the, this is like a love note of love notes. And you sent me the most amazing, I'm not going to read it here because it's long, but it's great. And we will be using it everywhere. But you talked about how power of process truly has changed your business and, and how it really built confidence for you. And I'm, I'm, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about that transition from side hustle to full-time like interior design firm owner with like people, mm -hmm. like people working for you, part-time mm -hmm. employees. Um, but a few things that you said, just so people can kind of like get their ears up. Like if you're, if you're multitasking, come back to us right now. <laughs> you, after taking the course and really deciding you were going to make this design thing work, because it was a side hustle for, I think, three years, you said. Mm -hmm. yep. You quit your day job, right? You took it to a full-time profitable business. You hired your first part-time design associate. You we're gonna, We talked about this a little bit in the shorty <laughs> episode, how you doubled your leads. The total number of leads you had in 2023 was 25. And then in the first quarter alone of 2024, you got 44 leads. <laughs> you achieved a nearly 70%. These are your words from your email. I don't know if you remember writing this. You yes, I do. I do. do. I love it. Yes. I love how specific and concrete. You can tell you come from an accounting background. <laughs> like you're like, these are the facts. You achieved a nearly 70% lead conversion rate from a discovery call to booked consult. I love that you're tracking that. You sent out proposals for design fees you could only dream of people accepting. You also had taken pricing with confidence, my course where I teach mm. you how to price your services. And she, you say, trust me, still a lot of no's due to price objections, but the clients that are signing on trust me and the process and are a joy to work with. You say, I am truly living my dream. I know it's just the beginning. Pop has given me the framework to be able to scale my business to the next level. And I am witnessing this. All of this happened in under a year. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. talk about this. Like, yep. how did you go from side hustle to full-time interior design firm owner? Yes. Well, I mean, you, you know, so glad you read that because everybody should know how influential your course is for designers. And I remember drafting that email. I think it was the night before I left for High Point Market because I knew I was going to see you. And I knew there was no way that I could just tell you in person how impactful your course and your resources have been to me. So I was like, I just need to get this out on paper um, before I see you. So that was the impetus for sending it. Um, so that when I saw you in person, you knew how much you had impacted my life. Um, but yes, so moving from side hustle to full time, um, I'd love to share a little bit about that. I, um, I don't want anyone, it definitely was not overnight. Like as you mentioned, Rebecca, I did you know, for over three years for um, both jobs. And there were some key things that I think that I did as a side, as running my design business as a side hustle that ultimately set me up for success. Um, and so they might go against the grain with some of the um, traditional advice that you get from people. But the first thing that I would say that I did, and this is very ironic coming from an accountant, but I really ignored the numbers. So I know that's going to sound very odd. Um, in the beginning of my firm, beginning of running my, I wouldn't call it a firm then, but the beginning of running my side hustle, I didn't need, I had the luxury of not having to worry about making money, right? I wasn't paying myself. So what I focused on was um, gaining experience, really serving my clients well, and getting finished portfolio photos. So I wasn't always worried about getting the highest design fees or um, making the most margin on products. What I really did was, um, you know, bid lower on some projects to just get the experience. Like the first time someone came to me and um, I had the opportunity to do a full room from start to finish, like a, you know, empty space. I bid really low on that. And I over delivered on what my clients paid, um, paid me for. And, you know, same thing when the first, the first opportunity came, um, presented itself to work on a renovation. I was, oh, I've never, had, I've done my own renovation, but I've never been able to, to, you know, do a renovation for a client. So I bid low on that. So that would be, um, I know it's counterintuitive, but that's what I focused on because I valued the most getting the experience, having happy clients that would then refer me and also getting those finished portfolio um, photos. Wow. You know, I think that's actually really good advice because I think not, not that I would ever suggest someone ignore the numbers. I mean, it's helpful to track them, but you are still mm -hmm. the type of person who was always going to be tracking the numbers because that's who you are. Uh, but there's so much value in building your portfolio and there's two ways to do it. 
The first way is you do your own house, right? There's people who have the means to do what they want in their own home and then they can showcase their talent that way and then start to bring in jobs. Or the second way is like you said, you take on whatever projects come your way. You do things for friends and family. You do things for free. You offer your services for a charity or whatever it might be just to get some examples that you you need proof that you can do what you say you can do. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I love that. That's actually, that, that's yeah. really, I love that you've shared that. It's against the grain in the sense yes. of like, we want you making money eventually. Yes, but. yes. I mean, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Being profitable now is super important, but at the beginning when I had another, uh, you know, full-time job to fall back on, I didn't worry about that part so much. I love that advice. What else? What else? Okay. So this goes back to power of process as well. And, you know, casting your vision. But I think from the beginning, I got very clear about the services that what I wanted to offer, um, the level of design work that I wanted to be doing, um, and the clients that I wanted to serve. And so um, I know a lot of people will tell you from the beginning, just say yes to everything. But I really had to have the fortitude to say no to a lot of pro projects or clients that didn't serve the vision that I saw for my business um, to let to have um, the space and the opportunity to say yes to the right clients that came along. So I really did have to protect my time and my energy because it was a side hustle. And so, um, you know, of course, I said, you know, the very first clients that came to the door, of course, I said yes to, to pretty much everything. Um, but once I had some experience under my belt, and once I had started to build that portfolio, I really only said yes to the pro projects that were full service design projects um, that had a really healthy budget that, you know, so that I could do the level of work that I wanted to do. And so that I could get those professional photo photographs. And that was important to me um, because I was doing this on the nights and weekends and I was taking time away from my family and my kids. And so I had to protect that space and that energy so that when the right projects came along, I could say yes. That's great. I mean, it, it, that is probably one of the scariest things that a business owner ever goes through is, is saying, saying no to a client or sometimes it's not directly saying no, it's, it's setting your business up in such a way that it deters some people. They might say you're too expensive. Your timeline is too long, whatever it might be. And those are those, um, it's almost like a boundary you're putting in place to only let the right people in. And that can be scary because there's the fear of, well, what if I say no to them and then I don't get another job? Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you, what I'm hearing you say is like you were able to do that because you still had the revenue or the income from your day job so that okay, you could wait it out and see if another client came. But it sounds like even if you hadn't had the day job, that was the right choice to make because it quickly opened you up to the opportunities with the right people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep, yep. And you and you're, how you describe that as well, like you're not saying no to people. You're exactly right. I never just said, no, I'm not going to take your job. It was just more explaining what I offer and the level of investment that that requires and how I serve my clients and people self-select themselves out after that. Oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking for someone for procurement or to do the project management. I can handle that. I'm like, okay. You know, and I just would explain, well, that's not the level of service that I like to bring to my clients. So, but I'm happy to refer you to a fellow designer in the area that I know is, would be perfect for you. So um, yeah, you're exactly right. It wasn't always saying no. Um, I would always take the time to help set those different people, you know, leads up for success as well, referring them out to different people or kind of giving them um, some resources to use. Yeah. And that speaks to your integrity too, right? It's like, I, I ultimately, you're not going to be served very well if I try to tweak and acquiesce and do things the way that you think they should be done. It's just not going to serve either one of us. And so let me find someone mm -hmm. who's a better fit. And then yeah, you can go off, exactly. both going your ways. I love it. Yep. Yep. What else? What else? Um, so okay, so, so I, just I have a few. Going. I have yeah. a few. Um, my next one is offer procurement services. So I knew from the very beginning that, um, you know, just from listening to thousands of hours of podcasts and reading all about the interior design business that I would not be able to run, um, eventually do this full time and be profitable if I did not offer procurement. Um, because I know that you cannot, my design firm, I cannot um, sustain just on design fees alone. So on my very first paying client, I literally was only selecting a light fixture and a rug for their dining room. Um, but even still, I sourced via trade-only vendors and I handled the procurement. And it was a great way to tiptoe into that 
scary world of trade only vendors and purchasing. Um, but it just kind of set me in motion for the next project where, um, you know, you're purchasing a little bit more and then eventually you're doing a full room for clients. So I would say that was key um, to my success was doing that early on as well. Okay. So this is a really important point. And I do want us to just take a moment for this point because you come from a financial background mm -hmm. uh, and it's so interesting because there are still designers out there that don't make money from product. And I'm sorry, just before I go there, I'm assuming you do not share your discounts with your clients or your markups, right? You are, you are making a profit on each item in addition yes. to your design fee. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Okay. Just to be clear in case anyone's wondering, what does she mean by that? <laughs> um, and I obviously talk about that all the time because I noticed for me that that was a big bit of money on the table. And I've had lots of conversations on the podcast about it, but I think it's really interesting, especially when I speak to others like yourself who come from a numbers background, who come from an accounting financial background, it's so clear to you that that mm -hmm. is the way to a profitable business. So can we just mm -hmm. like take a moment there, like from your expertise, because you have mm -hmm. expertise in this area, share with designers, let's just like really hit this one home why yeah. that is important and how that helps you? Yeah, um, absolutely. So you only have so many hours in the day and they're not all billable, whether you're working flat fee or hourly. However, um, that is, it's just not scalable. There's only so many hours. So really you're just like on a perpetual hamster wheel, right? To just try and bill enough hours to make enough money to cover your overhead and your team and the, you know, their salaries and, and paying yourself. Um, so for me, the design fees cover, I would say my operating expenses. So paying my salary, uh, my team members, all of the overhead that I have, and then the margin on the products just gives me a buffer. I call it my retained earnings. So it's just kind of its own special account in my, um, you know, in my banking records where I just keep that as my retained earnings for things to pay for, like marketing or professional photography or investing in your home office, like I just did. So, um, yeah, that just, it was I actually really love this. Can we just take another second? Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. So, so you are actually, I love this. This is so strategic guys. Listen, this is such <laughs> good advice. I'm going to take some advice from you on this. So the money that you collect for your design services, like your fees, your time covers all your expenses. I mean, we're talking a perfect scenario here, right? Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. are not exceeding um, your operating expenses, meaning not the extra things, but the things like if you had rent, rent, mm -hmm. um, people who work for you, your computer, your internet, your whatever hosting platform for your website, those ongoing yeah. expenses. Then what I think I'm understanding is any money that you make off of product goes into a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. And that is in some ways your profit or your, or your, uh, whatever you called it, retained earnings, such an accounting yeah. term. I love it. I'm like, I don't fully understand that, but sure, we'll go with it. Um, <laughs> and so that is like your bonus cash to bonus. grow your business mm -hmm. or pay yourself a bonus mm -hmm. or all the things. I love Pay that. my team a bonus, hopefully at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I one day want to get a space, you know, outside of my home, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I came that. from, you, you know, yeah. And I came from a world where I did get an annual bonus. So now I have to create my own. Right. So totally. Oh my God. I love that. Yeah. Okay. What else? Yeah. Okay. Um, build community and network. So again, this goes back to power process, but I can't stress um, the power. I know you talk about this all the time, Rebecca, but the power of community. Um, you just never know what going to a networking event, who you're going to meet, how that will impact your business. Um, and you know what you how it can be mutually beneficial so for me um power process i met so many lovely designers you know uh that have helped me with my business um a few that you know became an accountability partner that we would hop on a zoom i say i would call and say or text or email and say hey i have this huge proposal um shout out to lauren windsor house of windsor um she was my accountability partner yeah, yes. And I was, you know, so nervous about sending out this proposal. She, I sent it to her. She reviewed it for me. She gave me the most amazing constructive feedback before I sent it off to a client and I got the job. So things like um, going to a networking event and meeting a contractor who you really, um, you know, get along with and think you can work well together and you can become referral partners for each other. So building your community, 
building your network has was just really huge. And I think, um, you know, Power Process gave me the confidence to go out and network and, and do that as well. Oh my God, I love it. Uh, I love how you're giving us such concrete, actionable items. Guys, I hope you're taking notes. And if you're driving, you're going to want to re-listen to this episode. Okay. Is there anything else that that you want to share with us that helped you go and turn your business from a side hustle into the full, the full meal deal? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, all that money that you haven't been paying yourself because it's a side hustle, you need to reinvest that back into your business. So for me, that looked like investing in courses like power of process It meant investing in professional photography. Um, from the very beginning, I used a really uh, reputable and talented uh, photographer, interiors photographer in our area. Um, it meant going to high point market. Um, it meant um, outsourcing things that aren't my zone of genius, like Asana setup and creating those client facing docs um, and then having, and then reinvesting into employees as well to propel my business forward. So um, yeah, that would, would be my last little. What would you say to the designer? I think that's really great. And what would you say to the designer who is like, well, I'm not going to invest in, like, why would I pay thousands of dollars to a professional photographer when I'm just starting out? I don't have the capital. I don't have the cash. Or if I have it, I don't see the value of spending it. I'm just mm-hmm. going to take my own pictures. What would you say to that designer? I think you can't afford to not take the pictures. You really can't. I don't know how you would attract clients without professional photographs of what showing what you can do. It's a visual business. Um, this is, I mean, that's what if you, I, I, I just can't even imagine. I mean, for me, I did start with my own home. That was my very first portfolio of photographs and I invested um, and I would not have had clients like that would have hired me without those. I don't, I really think it's an, a matter of you can't afford not to do it. Yeah, I, I do. I do think so too. And I, similarly to you, I mean, for me, it wasn't a side hustle. It was a full-time gig from the get-go, but I remember Oh my God. My first project that I did on my own was this pretty big project. Actually, it was a condo, this complete gut renovation decorating. And I didn't really, I mean, I was making money on the project and I did pretty well, but like in my mind, I was like, that was very expensive. And at the time I look back on how much the photography costs and I laugh. I'm like, Oh my God, that was expensive (laughs) because prices have gone up so much. But I think it was, I don't know. I think it was probably $1,500 or maybe it was like $900 just hovering in that range for the day. Um, no, I think it was probably less than a, less than a thousand. And I remember thinking, I am going to do this and I'm going to freaking maximize it. Mm-hmm. And I went to HomeSense. I went to every store where I could buy anything that I could return from accessories. I brought yep. in my own area rugs because there were things that in the end we did for the client that weren't necessarily really how I wanted to project my brand. And I came in with intentionality And I hired an assistant just for the day and she helped me unpack and style. I did most of the styling so I could capture as many. And I was like squeezing that photographer. (laughs) I was getting as many shots as I could that day because this was going to be my marketing for like a year. And it was a marketing for years. And (laughs) in the meantime, while I was styling and working with the photographer on the shots, the assistant was packing everything back up, putting things in the home sense bags. We had to take pictures of the client's house because it wasn't my house so that we knew exactly where to put mm. all their little tchotchkes back. Yeah. Right. Cause it's a lot of yes. work. And back then it's so much work. I waited too long to do my photo shoots. Like now I do them immediately. Right. When we finish mm. the project, even if there's like a couple things missing, I'm like, I don't care because I learned the hard way that once clients are living in their space for a few months, like they make it theirs, which is great for them, but not always great for photography. And it was an investment. I remember feeling stretched to do it, but I used those pictures, social media, website, internal, like I used them for years, like years for my business. Yeah. The return on that investment for that about 1000 or $1,500. You can't even quantify how much work that brought in for you. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I know how much work that is. I did the same thing. I mean, I sent my I photographed my own house. I think I sent my kids and my husband away for four days to my in-laws so that I could stage prep and have That's have hard. the space to myself. Um, but same thing, the home goods shopping and the returns. And even my first few photo shoots um, for clients was the same thing. I 
I pretty much was just styling their home for free. Uh, and that goes back to my, um, you know, first point, like, you know, they weren't paying me to do it, but I offered to style it. And I just said, you don't, you're not obligated to keep anything. Um, but I'd love to style it for you and see if you like it. And I'd love the opportunity to photograph your home. And they were like, sure, there's no risk to them. They weren't paying for me. They weren't paying ahead of time for the styling pieces. And honestly, they ended up keeping everything and the photographs came out. So it's worth that investment of time and energy and money really, um, to help propel your business forward. I love that. So what would you say now is your focus? Like now, so let's talk about what your business looks like today. Mm-hmm. So this mm-hmm. is, we're talking, you know, side hustle, turning it into a full-time deal. When did you, when did you quit your day job or like dedicate your full-time, your, yep. sorry, your time to your business full-time? Yep. Early 2024 is when I decided to go full-time and I brought on very quickly, I realized um, to be scalable and, you know, profitable, I would need to bring someone on. So I brought on my first associate designer, Riley. She's amazing. Um, Really funny story about how I hired her, but essentially we sat together on our, um, the PTO board at our children's school and I had no idea, um, but she majored in interior design. So once I found that out, I asked her to coffee, um, asked her if she would be willing to come on board on a part-time, you know, contract basis. And she happened to be looking for something as well. So the stars aligned and it's been fantastic. Um, so she's been on board for a few months now. And then I quickly realized once I was full-time that just due to the the process, like Riley, you know, I'm handling phase one, the leads, Riley and I are in phase two together, but I can't, it's really hard to onboard someone when you're still doing phase three project implementation. So I realized I needed help on the purchasing side. And so my second hire um, was a part-time employee who focuses, um, her title is operations and procurement associate. And she's going to focus on um, project management, project implementation, tracking orders to make that, um, to make phase three, like a really wonderful experience for our clients as well. I love that. I love that you have help and you've been really specific about it about like there's help in the design phase where we're focusing on making the selections, committing it to the drawings, et cetera, et cetera, presenting it. And then it's a separate type of help. Oh my gosh, I feel like, oh, if I'd only done this. I know so many people have learned from my mistakes, but dang, like I tried to have one person do all of it. Oh yeah. And then what would happen is exactly what you said, Andrea. It was like a bottleneck. We couldn't, Mm -hmm. we couldn't start the next design project as well as we wanted to, because we were still busy managing the ordering from the previous project and like good problems to have, but those are the growing pains that, that can, can hold you back from growth actually, if you're not Mm -hmm. really specific and strategic about it. And so at the time, I think I had a different mentality where I thought I just need to get, and people listening could probably relate to this. I just need to find like a mini me, like I need Mm -hmm. to find a design assistant who can do a little bit of everything like me and I can just delegate everything and they can manage the orders and it makes sense, right? Because then they know what we've selected and what we've designed. But what I've learned over time and what many people coming from corporate already understand is that there's there's different skill sets and there's different people for different roles. And so having that split that you have now, they're part-time, so that's perfect, Mm -hmm. means that everyone can be working in tandem as opposed to what are we going to do today? If you focus on design with me today, that means those orders like aren't getting followed up on. Or right. that means, remember, we didn't get back to the upholsterer. Uh, he had a question about, do we want to do a top stitch or what have you? But then that email gets pushed and then everyone feels spread thin and stressed. So good for you for recognizing that so early in your business, woman. Like, Thank you. Thank kudos you. to you. Yes, I appreciate that. I'm really excited by the team that I've built and, you know, hope to invest and grow in them over time as well. I know as my business grows, like I've definitely hired amazing women that can grow with my business as well. So I feel very fortunate to have found amazing people and, um, you know, that care about my business as much as I do as well. So I'm very fortunate. So talk to me about your experience going to High Point Market. Was that your first time in 2024 going to High Point? Yes, it was my first time. Um, and I wish that I had gone years earlier. Um, it was amazing. Um, and I do think it helps propel, help propel my business forward as well, for sure. Um, what do you think, what, what do you think about it? Do you wish you'd done sooner? Um, I, 
I mean, trust me, I love to source on the internet, but there is something about getting in front of vendors and making those connections with your reps, uh, seeing the products in person. Um, I'm really particular about what I source for clients and what I put into their homes and being able to communicate to my clients that, you know, I've invested time and money in going to North Carolina, sitting in the, the best sofas and testing the, the best case goods. And that's what I've selected to put in my client's home. So it's helped from a sales perspective in that I can really um, sell furniture that my clients don't have the ability to sit in or touch or feel or see in a local showroom. Um, and so that's been huge. And also just new vendors. Um, there's only so much you can do on the internet. Um, and so just walking around, you know, a whole city of furniture is such an amazing resource. And then of course, community, um, you know, you had your meetup at High Point. Mar so we got to meet so many other fellow um, designers, designer room members, Empower Our Process alumni, um, and just having that connection, those making those connections that I've continued to foster those relationships and friendships even after leaving High Point. Yeah, I love that. I, I agree. I think the community is so important. But what I think is really interesting, and I think it's something for many of you listening who haven't been to High Point, um, okay, yes, you can pick things on the internet. But I almost think that now that the world has gone more digital and showrooms have less product on their floor, like not at High Point, like in cities and towns, mm. it's actually almost more important than it ever was for a designer to go and see and touch and feel and get to know the product because you might be able to order direct in your town from a from a from a shop that sells that line but they're not carrying inventory anymore like mm. gone are the days of inventory being in the city where you live like when i first started my business no sorry when i first started working for a designer there were there were places in toronto that you would go and they what you saw on the floor was what you could order. Mm. Now they have less square footage. They like look at a catalog. They're showing you online. So it's such a benefit to your clients to be able to see, touch, and feel. And I remember, Andrea, being with you. I don't remember which showroom it was. Oh, I can't remember. What was the one? It's like in that main building across from I... What is it? IH IFC or whatever. Oh, IFHC. Yeah. International whatever. Home for IHFC. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Which one? Um, what is this? Where we met Jill and her, oh, her, yes. her rep was there. And yes. what was that for? What was that one again? Um, Ro? Was wasn't it, it Lee? Wasn't it Lee? Was, oh, Ro. And then, uh, or, yeah. Doesn't I think matter. we started in Lee and then we went to Ro. Okay. Anyhow, <laughs> we went in there and you were sitting on a, on a couch and you were like, Oh yeah, no, I just ordered this for a client. Oh, uh, I think you said that, right? The uh, yeah, maybe the uh, or I was thinking about it, maybe or the you were thinking sofa. about it. Yeah, you a were trying to make a decision. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it was so, and I and I was like witnessing firsthand like the power of that. Like you're mm -hmm. actually like you're about to place the order for a client based on what specifications and maybe some other things, but there you are sitting in it and you're testing it and you're leaning back and they're turning it into yeah. a bed or they're, you know, reclining for exactly. you. And you were able to like do these sit tests, which was a bit overwhelming, right? Cause it's <laughs> like, at some point they all start to blend together all the showroom. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but you take notes, you take pictures so you can remember um, like what a benefit to your clients. And I think that also yeah. adds to your level of professionalism and will help you uh, as you grow and scale really quickly. Yeah. I mean, we are asking our clients to trust us with a huge investment um, in their home. It's emotional. It's a big financial investment. And to be able to say to them, you know, I invest my time and energy as well to ensuring that the money that you're investing is going to wonderful products that I stand behind. So it's it's been huge and instrumental. And I'm looking forward to going back, making it part of my annual visit. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll meet each other again there for sure. Yes. Um, what, before we wrap our time together, mm -hmm. I feel like you've given so many nuggets. It seems greedy Aww. to ask for more. No. Um, what is a last nugget of wisdom that you would share with our audience today? Yeah, I'd love to share a little nugget. So in the beginning of my business, like most people, I absolutely struggled with imposter syndrome and, at ver and in various points um, and situations, I still do. Um, so this one I've always just carried with me. So it's just, do not be afraid of what other people think when they see you trying. Put your head down, do the work, and on focus on becoming the best at what you do. Love that. Yep. That applies to every human on this planet. <laughs> yes. I any industry. Yeah. And you know what I like that you that you highlighted actually there? 
is when they see you trying. Mm -hmm. That to me resonated. That's what matters, right? You're fucking Absolutely. trying, right? <laughs> and so like, yeah. who cares what people are saying? Look, they're not trying. Like, don't, it's hard to tune, to, it's hard sometimes to tune out the noise. Um, but that is such a great reminder. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. my guest on the podcast. I'm so oh excited God. to follow your journey and watch as your business totally explodes because it's already happening and you've barely <laughs> been doing this for a hot minute. I love it. Um, can you please let everybody know where they can find and follow you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my business name is Andrea Krill Interiors. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook under the same name. And my website is andreakrillinteriors.com as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today. Um, I can't wait. I know this is going to really resonate, really resonate with everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. It's certainly a pinch me moment for me in my uh, design journey and career. So thank you so much um, for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Okay, that was amazing. Guys, isn't she so smart? Andrea gave us so much information. I hope you took notes. If you didn't get to, go back and re-listen to it. She also did a record, uh, a shorty episode with me, which you guys will enjoy. We'll link that in the show notes. Um, I love this idea that you can move from a side hustle to a full-time profitable business by focusing on a few key elements. And of course, the money side, she she knows her money inside and out. But the idea of like, okay, I've, I need to, to focus on procurement. The only way I'm gonna be able to grow this and scale this to make the revenue I want to make is by reselling products to clients. And you guys hear me talk about this all the time. I feel like a broken record, but it's such a great reminder that you need to look at the money. And thank you, Andrea, for saying that at the beginning, you really did ignore the numbers because there is something to be said for getting some a bit of portfolio uh, work so that you can show and prove that you can do what you can do. But very quickly, if you're going to do that, you need to start finding the ways to make money. And so thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your bank tidbit. I'm like, oh, shoot. I feel like, why haven't I done that? It's such a good idea of separating the revenue that you receive for your design fees and services and time from the money that you're receiving for products, like the profit you make off of the products. Um, and seeing that almost as the gravy that you can reinvest in your business. What a smart cookie. Andrea, you have been such an incredible member of the Power of Process community of Designers Room, always sharing your knowledge, always being in community. I can't wait to have you back a year from now or so and see where your business is at. Thank you again for joining me today. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please let me know if you are liking these episodes where you get to hear from past students and designers that are up and coming, hearing their journey. Uh, because I always want to hear from you guys. Leave me a review on iTunes, please, please, please. If you enjoy this podcast, if you've been binging it, please leave me a review, five stars if you can, um, so we can get more eyeballs or eardrums on this. And that's it. I'll see you soon. Have a great day.